Anyway, I want to welcome you all to the Flying Squirrel Community Space. Um, we are really excited to have uh, Ryan Harvey and David Rovix here. So let me um, introduce you to Ryan Harvey. He's um, actually from uh, Baltimore, Maryland and he's actually starting his tour here. Um, he's going to be starting his tour from here, then going on to Toronto and a lot of different cities, in the, and we're very glad to have him. He, is, um, he and some friends started the Civilian Soldier Alliance, which is a group of civilians working with veterans and active soldiers who uh, are against the war in Iraq and Afghanistan. So, and he's been very involved with IVAW. So, if you would welcome him and um, give him a round of applause, and I hope you enjoy the show. Thanks, Susan. Thanks for giving me directions three times. <laughs> I got lost a couple times. Um, Hi everybody! Hi. Thanks. Hi. If y'all are in seats and you want, feel free to move up. I won't be. Um, there are so many cushions. I won't feel awkward. <laughs> they brought them um, so yeah, I just I just put a new CD out that I've been working on for two and a half years. Um, I thought it would be I thought it was that time in life to take a full time job in the trades, and I've been doing construction for the last uh, three and a half years, and um, it was fun for a little while. <laughs> um, it was like exotic, you know, like, oh, working with, people are like, hey, you're working with your hands. Like, yeah, I'm actually permanently damaging my hands is what I'm doing. Um, but I still do that, um, but it, it stifled my music a bit, so recently I made a decision to put some new emphasis on that, and that's what brought me here. Um, I mean, many things brought me here, but this is one of them. Um, and uh, I'm just going to get started, since we're talking about not enjoying your job, but, but needing to do it. So this is a, it's about the bailout. Um, I wrote this. I've changed the chorus of this three times. Well, two technically, because it was 2008 when I wrote it, um, which is part of the reason I had to finish my album when I did, because 11 doesn't s s fit syllabically in the song, so I needed to record it before 10 was over. <laughs> United States, bought and sold, folks sleeping out on the streets of gold, working family debt piles high, economic homicide, close the shelter, close the schools, build condos for the lucky few, inflate that real estate balloon, rebuild the city for the silver spoons. They need a new hotel, they need a new convention center and two stadiums and they don't want to pay for them unelected suit and ties in the era of free enterprise making record profits from the finance boom with the gold taxpayer parachutes throwing money around the globe knocking countries over with the heavy load shock therapy troops and tricks predatory economics it's 2010 and we're racing down to the bottom it's 2010 and we're racing down to the bottom One trillion dollar bailout deal Throw it all on the roulette wheel In unrestricted greed we trust Come the bus, this country's fucked Bail out the bankers, not the single moms Take loans from China to pay for the bombs Get the rich banker the bailout funds It'll trickle down like sewage does It's 2010 and we're racing down to the bottom It's 2010 and we're racing down to the bottom The world's greatest debtor nations got the planet locked in debt repayments. Prosecuting petty thieves while their companies do it all legally. The first world elite's imperial dreams made the third world through investment schemes. Now they're starving in a world of food. That's no mistake, that's an attitude. 
It's 2010 and we're racing down to the bottom. It's 2010 and we're racing down to the bottom. It's 2010 and we're racing down to the bottom. It's 2010 and we're racing down to the bottom. So that, that, um, that song was partially inspired by the book The Shock Doctrine by Naomi Klein. If y'all haven't picked that up, pick that up. It's really good. Naomi Klein is like the perfect blend of three things. Badass organizer activist, awesome investigative journalist, great historian. That combination gives her like a good attitude in her writing. Really like. So I wrote this song um, a couple, maybe two months ago. I was at work and I uh, heard a gunshot. I looked out the window and I saw a kid running off and I ran outside and there was a kid lying in the street. He had been shot, thankfully only in the leg. Thankfully. But I wrote this about seeing that and the, all the people gathered around. There was only one person crying. She was uh, just sitting right next to him. And everyone else was just kind of blank faced. And I was thinking about the sort of the gender roles of that. She was the only woman on the scene. And how uh, none of these guys were crying or looked sad. They just looked really accepting. And partially that's coping with the reality of a lot of young folks uh, grow up with, but it's not, coping mechanisms aren't always good things, you know, sometimes you gotta cry, you gotta admit things are really wrong, you know. Blue summer sky, muggy summer heat, and an old mason's laughing laying blocks of concrete, it's that out in the open charm of a Baltimore street. Then a bullet flies by Saw the kid shot Heard him crying out Trying to find somebody who could make the pain stop His sister was crying on the steps Fearing what would happen next More the same And she's searching for a new world In the shadow of the old Trying to shake off the past but it's such a heavy load Looking for direction But there's so many dead end roads It's so far, so far, so far away from here You got the scapegoat, got the blame Got the anger, got the shame Got a hundred different forces Working against you and your name There's so few to trust In this world of guns and handcuffs It's more the same She's searching for a new world In the shadow of the old Trying to shake off the past But it's such a heavy load Looking for direction But there's so many dead end roads It's so far, so far, so far away from here But she still finds time to smile Selling snowballs on her porch Singing songs as she walks to the grocery store Too young to hold such pain But she's old enough to try Oh, here's the future, brother It's in your sister's open mind And she's searching for a new world In the shadow of the old Trying to shake off the past But it's such a heavy load Looking for direction But there's so many dead end roads It's so far, so far, so far away from here
California city where we call them snowballs instead of snow cones, but a lot of people sell snowballs on their porches in Baltimore. And it's, it's like an instant business. It's really cool. Um, but uh, yeah, so I'm going to follow that with a my, my, my album that I, that I have back there that's new called Blowback is, is a very sad album. Um, it's, I don't think, I was telling somebody this earlier, I don't think it's sad if you think about this, these things all the time. I think it actually might make you feel good. That's what it did for me when I wrote it. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe I should have pulled more people than myself for that. But, um, but my, I, 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 I told myself while I was writing that, I said, you need to learn to write more positive songs. I grew up with too much punk rock. It came out. It all came out negative. And it's hard to write a positive folk song because it's it's really easy to like just write. I don't know. It's really easy to be perceived as really cheesy if you're writing positive acoustic music. But if you're writing angry acoustic music, it's like oh, that's cool. Um, so my new album that's not out yet is called Ordinary Heroes, um, and this is one of the songs from it. This goes out to any Vietnam vets in the room. Also goes out to David Zeiger for producing the film Sir No Sir. Another. If you haven't seen that, you should really pick up that. It's a documentary about the active duty GI movement against the Vietnam War. And this guy is interviewed in it extensively. Terry Whitmore went off to war. He saw the same nightmare so many seen before. He saw the facts all distorted, all the murders unreported, burned down villages, mass graves, and more. But he shook it off, tried to play it cool, awoke each morning trying to make it through. Just take it day by day and try to kill the enemy, cause if you don't, he or she might be killing you. Terry Whitmore was a Marine, a hard and angry, well-oiled machine. Ready on command to tighten up his hand and send a thousand rounds flying through the trees. He walked the trails, each step with care, in case the landmines start exploding everywhere. But as the bodies piled up, he didn't seem so tough, cause those romantic myths of war all disappeared. Terry Whitmore, he got it bad. Countless shards of metal sticking in his leg. They were under open skies and they were taken by surprise. And the mortar landed a couple of feet away. And he was taken off to Japan. Got a metal pin from LBJ's own hand. And he was hurt, but he was strong, cause he was finally going home. But once he could walk, they tried to send him back again. Terry Whitmore, he finally fled. He met some anti-war activists in Japan. And they helped him flee, got him a ticket for free on the Underground Railroad heading west. So there he was, all in disguise, deserting on with six other guys. And he said, fuck you, Uncle Sam, I've got my freedom back again. You can keep your war and all your racist lies, cause I was fighting the Viet Cong while back in Memphis cops was chasing us with dogs did I really do that shit my government pushed me into it Terry Whitmore's fight was not in Vietnam Terry Whitmore he was but one of the soldiers who did what had to be done Cause in breaking with the lies, he saved countless lives Cause when he walked away, he helped in Vietnam When he walked away, he helped in Vietnam Sometimes when you just keep going, 
Um, while I'm figuring this out, we're in the presence of some brave folks who deserted the U.S. military. So I want to shout out to you guys from Iraq Veterans Against the War, who are war resistors. Yeah, if you guys, uh, f folks haven't, uh, met your local Iraq Veterans Against the War members back there at their table, um, where my CDs are as well, um, go talk to them, get in touch. And, uh, if you're, if you're interested in hearing about what non-veterans, um, can do to get involved in, in that work, feel free to talk to me, because that's what I do, um, part of my life. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Um... Oh yeah. I'm gonna do a somewhat sad song and then we're gonna do a funny song. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this uh, this song is um about my uh my childhood friend Austin, who was my babysitter, who taught me how to say the word fuck, which you've heard me use eloquently several times already. <laughs> So props to Austin. But um, unfortunately, he never had a chance to join Iraq Veterans Against the War because he was killed two weeks before he came home in uh, 2006. And I wrote this after uh, his funeral and uh, talking to friends and explaining that I wasn't mad at the people who killed him because I think they were fighting for a just cause. And um, the strange circumstances of that. You know, it's strange to lose somebody you care about so much and be so sad about their death. Um, and I don't blame him for anything, but I also can't blame the people who, who took his life because I think that if my country was occupied, um, I would hope that I would have the guts to do the same things that they did. Every bomb carries with it the stories of the dead. The stories shared choking back tears between the family and the friends. Every name has a history, every bomb is an end. The memories of the grieving are all that we've got left And this is how it ends You see your friend Lying in his brand new coffin The shaky hands have built the bomb and set it to explode Who picked the date? and the time and placed it on the road they didn't write the plans for war they didn't attack new york they're victims of our foreign policy and that's what they're fighting for and this is how it ends you see your friend lying in his brand new coffin How would you react if soldiers occupied our streets? Would you fight in the name of your country like Muhammad and Khalid? We took this nation's world and everybody knows what for. I don't blame the one who built the bomb, I blame the ones who built the war. And this is how it ends. You see your friend lying in his brand new coffin. Thanks. Thanks, so yeah, um, that song is on that new CD of mine too. Um, hmm. Since we were listening to Woody Guthrie. Um, as we were walking in. This is a rewritten Woody Guthrie song. Um, <laughs> uh, this is on a, a CD back there called The Good Times and the Bad. That's a split I did with Mark Gunnery, who's also my roommate and longtime uh, co-collaborator, co-conspirator, co-cooker. A lot of things when you live with somebody. Um, <laughs> this is a rewrite of a song called uh, 
talking mean machine, or mean talking, I don't know what it's called. One of those. Woody Guthrie probably changed it all the time anyway. But we wrote this um, after Hugo Chavez made that speech at the UN. That shit was too funny. And I say to people, regardless of how you feel about Hugo Chavez, if you're an anarcho-chavista, or if you're an anti-Chavez anarchist, or if you're something else, it doesn't really matter. What's important is that he's a really funny dude to have around. <laughs> you know, Evo Morales doesn't say anything funny like that, and neither did Che Guevara. Che Guevara's speech at the UN was real serious. Chavez just called Bush a donkey. <laughs> and that's what the world needed. Because the world had been making serious speeches and doing really serious things, and they just couldn't quite cut through the bullshit. Well, I'm the meanest man, I got a five-sided brain Most folks around me think I'm insane But it doesn't faze me, not one bit You say I'm crazy, I don't give a shit, I'm mean Well, I'm mean to my mother, I'm mean to my brother Mean to anyone I think of as an other And if you don't want to play nice with me I'll bring democracy to your stupid country, I'm mean I say to Mark, well, maybe when you get older You'll be a little bit nicer And he's like, dude, I'm like 230-some years old I'm not getting any nicer well, I'm mean in the East, I'm mean in the West. Free market meanness is what I like best. I go around putting lots of folks in debt and then I screw them over on the interest. The econ people call them structural adjustment programs. Neoliberalism. Mortgage-backed securities, what are other words? Come on. Credit default swaps. That's a good punk band name, by the way. If anybody wants to make a punk band called the Credit Default Swaps, you got my support. I'll be your basis. Um, what are I go around overthrowing governments with the army or economics For fruit and gold and gasoline Well, I've funded many a mean machine Folks like Suharto, Augusta Pinochet, Manuel Noriega, No Dindiem, Saddam Hussein, Marcos, Galtieri, the Contras, the Chavaran, Musharraf, Duvalier, and many others And Osama <laughs> Well, I profit from wars, I profit from jails, I profit from diseases, I profit from sales, I profit from things you think would sadden me. I even found a way to profit off of tragedies, things like tsunamis, hurricanes, earthquakes, bird flu, pit bulls, the Loch Ness Monster. What else? What others? Pet psychologists. Many other things. And Osama. <laughs> huh, what comes here? Oh yeah, I got friends. I got a lot of other folks that roll with me, like the Saudis and South Korea, Israel, Australia, and Pakistan, and my little cousin England, and sometimes Haiti, depending on how recently I've kidnapped their president. <laughs> Oh, but Hugo Chavez doesn't roll with me. He doesn't like my type of hegemony. He called me the devil on live TV. He's got a point. I am an asshole. Yeah, well, listen here, Mr. Communist. I dare you to come to the next UN conference because I'll blow up your helicopter or poison your cigar. And Mark says, uh, I don't smoke cigars. And I say, I don't give a shit. I don't like the UN anyway. It's a bunch of communists. I mean, you know about the French. Yeah, some folks don't like what I do. I say they're all Islamo-fascist too. When folks question me, it really gets me going. See, I'm just trying to keep this oil flowing, get rid of trade barriers. Keep people working good, long, hard American hours. Hurt people, hurt animals. Keep AIDS medications out of the hands of poor people across the global south. Establish sweatshops around half the planet and many other things. That's all I'm trying to do. Spread freedom. Oh yeah, I'm pro-life. Thanks, y'all. <laughs> um, a lot of the 
funny things uh, Mark wrote. I named all the dictators. <laughs> Unreleased song. We're standing on the shoulders of people who sat and stood and fought and sacrificed their lives and time so that we'd be better off. I'm talking about ordinary people whose courage held them through. We need many Harriet Tubmans and we need many Sojourner Truths, ordinary heroes. In the factories in Lawrence, or the mines in Trinidad, grew a spirit of justice that spread across the nation, and lit a fire that burned so bright that it still brings people hope. We need many Big Bill Haywoods, and we need many Mother Joneses, ordinary heroes, ordinary heroes. Ordinary Heroes. This is partially inspired by a zine that someone wrote. I forget the name, but it's about Harriet Tubman, and it's kind of reconsidering the history of Harriet Tubman. And it's suggesting that Harriet Tubman's story is written in a way that no black woman living today could see herself in Harriet Tubman's shoes, and how problematic that is as a form of writing history. And that history of heroes has to be written in a way that they're average people that you could be, you know? Great changes don't come about from some mystical twist of luck. They're the fruits of people sweating and stressing and never giving up. It takes a lot of hard work and commitment to lift every voice and sing. We need many Ella Bakers and we need many Martin Luther Kings, ordinary heroes. But most of all, this song was inspired by the passing of Howard Zinn. And his legacy, and all the historians who are going to fill his shoes. He was a tall dude, he probably had pretty big shoes, you know. We're standing on the shoulders of people who put a lot of hard work in and passed along their trials and errors to future generations and the stories that we pass along will be the thing that keeps us in we need many Woody Guthrie's and we need many Howard Zinn's ordinary heroes ordinary heroes ordinary heroes obsessed with history. Thanks, Arzun. <laughs> um, speaking of history, um, I wrote this recently because I was really frustrated with the Tea Party. Um, believe it or not. Um, and especially with the, the dichotomy between, I played this song at a show recently and this guy was like, I was loving your set until that song. It really offended me. And I was like, why did it offend you? And he was like, he had been to some Tea Party rallies um, and was like, I think you've, your perception of the Tea Party is false. I think you're talking about the leadership and not their rank and file. And I was like, well, you know, maybe, maybe you're right. And uh, unfortunately, um, leadership, sometimes, you know, leadership takes credit over membership in, in countries, organizations and whatnot. Um, and it's the responsibility of, of those rank and file people to keep their leaders in check or give them the boot. Um, but I can't, I can't have somebody who, who Sarah Palin is their leader tell me that I've got a misunderstanding about their movement. Like, to, to that extent that I'm, like, wrong. Like, I think, 
You know, like, maybe, like, your leader talks too much or, or has a little bit of an ego or something like that. But if you're like, oh, my leader's, like, super racist, but we're not. It's like, oh, that's, like, confusing to some of us. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. So this is about that. Um, but it's about the Boston Tea Party is, is like, among the, the cooler radical incidents of, of American history. Um, especially of white American history. And there's bad things that happen in the Tea Party. Nothing's perfect, obviously. We could... We could dissect the fact that some folks were just like Native Americans, which is obviously screwed up, right? But like the, the, a lot of people weren't, and the, the act that they did was corporate sabotage against an occupying power. I support that. Sarah Palin doesn't. Um, <laughs> if the Tea Party is into corporate sabotage against occupiers, I'd like to talk to some of them. So if any of you are out there, let's, let's chat. So this is about the, the American history and the Tea Party and my perception of their stories. <laughs> Like when a bunch of white people are like, we gotta take the country back. And you're like, oh, am I misunderstanding something? Or... Tea party on the Capitol lawn, asking you which side you're on, drawing battle lines in this country. We're a rich nation full of boarded homes, crowded prisons, abandoned schools, poor folks with hard goals, rich folks with poor souls, undereducated, underhomed, underpaid and overloaned, clinging hard to what we own, trying to win the rat race. Oh, so you hate taxes on the working poor Unless, of course, they're for the war Or putting a wall along the border But not for nurses and doctors Priorities flips the way it looks to me And I work hard as hell for my money But I don't believe in an economy That forces folks to crawl Tea party on the Capitol lawn And Sarah Palin singing along Laughing all the way to the Pentagon Remember when Sarah Palin and John McCain Were railing against Washington? John McCain was talking about Washington. John McCain's been in Washington for like 300 years. And he's going to oh, we got to stop Washington. <laughs> Tea party on the Capitol lawn, asking you which side you're on, drawing battle lines in this country. Oh, but there's something about our worldview, something about the lens we look through that keeps us from building something new that works out better for more of us. Well, it's in the cracks where the levees broke. It's in the cash Goldman Sachs stole. It's in the fields of tomatoes where the legacy of slavery roams. It's a hatred born of jealous fear, a hatred born and bred right here. Xenophobic and insecure with a deadly outcome. It's a racism that grows and thrives when religion's used to justify an endless list of human rights denied in the name of liberty. Tea party on the Capitol lawn and the Christian terrorists are singing along, getting ready for the race war. I also wrote this right after that a terrorist organization in Michigan got arrested and they refused to call them terrorists because they're white and they're Christians. But they were going to shoot a cop, then they were going to blow the cop's funeral up with IEDs. But they weren't terrorists. But my friends protest outside of a corporation that supports animal testing, and they're terrorists. And they get arrested and sent to prison. They're telling me immigrants should go back home. I say no, the ground that you're standing on. Cause Arizona was Mexico and your grandparents were Europeans. And your national heroes like Thomas Paine were immigrants when they came and called themselves Americans. And that's how it's always been. No, Maria and Juan didn't steal your jobs. They were outsourced by Bill and Ron as South America's wealth was robbed by U.S. corporations. So when they dumped the tea in Boston, it was an attack against a corporation So I don't see the connection between that story and yours And Crispus Attucks and the Boston dead weren't fighting for a white nation They were fighting an occupation Like the Iraq and Afghan wars Tea party on the Capitol lawn Asking you which side you're on Drawing battle lines in this country
Sweet. All right, I will squeeze three songs into that. Um, oh, this is where my numbering system ends. Whoa, what's gonna happen here? Um, <clears throat> Since we're on the, this is such an American theme, I'm gonna stick with this. I'm, 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 I have this, it's not a theory. Why was I gonna say theory? I think, that's a better way to say it. I think that, um, that a lot of radicals in the U.S., hate their history and avoid their history and run from their history because there's so many awful things that have happened in American history. Um, and it's so hard to face them and understand them and, and, and it's also really hard to find stories like for me growing up a young white man and looking for people like me in history that I can feel good about was really difficult. Because um, all the people you see in mainstream history are people that I am ashamed to be part of the legacy of and hope to not be part of the legacy of. Um, but, uh, so, but there are those characters, they're just, they're just hidden, um, because they were regular people, um, and sometimes they were in the, in the mob, and you can read about the mob and how bad it was, and then you read their stories, and you're like, oh, that's where I was at, okay, um, and so I wrote this song as part of that, <clears throat> and this is on that new CD too, um, just sort of looking at some of the myths of American history and sort of how, it's, how it affects our lives today. American mythology, the stories told about Squanto and the great feasts. Natives sitting down with European settlers in the celebration of some future of peace And it's depressing when you hear the real story How their diseases spread like wildfire And how they tore the land right out from under their feet And made them servants of the war-crazed British Empire Religious freedom, that's bullshit. I see genocide when I look into it. And Christians killing savages in the name of God, invoking their religion to justify their deaths. And I understand there's many types of Christians. There's many types of Muslims and there's many types of Jews But there's also many ways to exploit and kill people And there's just as many ways for your faith to be abused Oh, oh There's deep incisions in our history No The scars of the past mark the face of today So I don't celebrate no holidays with roots and land theft. I don't salute no flags that stand for hate. I don't bow to any leaders who kill for salvation. And I don't pray to any gods who do the same. I have neither an Irgun or Al-Qaeda. No Reagan, no Stalin, no nation, no king. I have faith in the prospect of change. With the people around me embracing equality, oh, oh, there's deep incisions in our history, no, the scars of the past mark the face of today. So, important note, obviously that's not an anti-religious song, it's, it's, a, it's an anti-fundamentalist song, um, and it's 
against anyone of any religion who does horrible things in the name of their religion. And for any atheist who does horrible things in the name of atheist, <laughs> the point is what you do here in front of me. That's what that song's about. Um, what should I do here? Hmm. All right, we'll do a rowdy one, and then we'll close with a song. Yes, this, this is definitely rowdy. If I don't faint, faint during this song, I'm not fainting tonight. So Mark Gunnery, who wrote the funny part of that earlier song, part of this song's about him. I was out uh, on tour years ago. Um, when I'm out on tour, it means I'm like staying at a friend's house. Um, <laughs> you know, we were getting high on the bus. And, no. Um, it means I was in like a crowded living room. And we were in Olympia, Washington, and the people who set our show up get a phone call. And they were like, all right, it's happening, Tacoma. And all these people are like, oh my God, okay, all right, all right. And I'm like, yo, what's happening, what's going on? What's happening? And they're like, there's a military shipment going out. And I was like, oh, okay. So we find ourselves down at the port of Tacoma, Washington at two in the morning till about four, 4.30. And uh, I rolled down there with Mark and with uh, these two Iraq veterans who are friends of mine, who are both members of Iraq Veterans Against the War. And we all roll down there and uh, we're trying to blockade these strikers that are going to Iraq as the first one of the first deployments of the surge in 2007. And uh, I left, uh, I had to leave town and the protest went on for 10 more days and I wrote this uh, to encourage them. They got cops on the streets, walking in lines with taser guns, wooden batons, trying to keep you scared with violent attacks. You know it all comes down to how you react, and now you're face to face, seeing it all, dispersal warnings, and making the call. They got buses to pack with people like you, and they did that in the 50s. The movement grew. Young student, new to the game, movement elder, fan in the flames, combat veteran, seen it before, same tactics used in the foreign war. Final warning, you're keeping your ground. Committed people sitting all around. Through the bullhorn, it's all distorted. You can't leave now, we can't afford it. Hold the line, even if your voice shakes, friend of mine. Even if your voice shakes, push forward, it's up to you. See it through. A funny uh, antidote to the story. So uh, the protesters weren't the only ones holding the line against all odds, because apparently there was this line of police standing on the railroad tracks, and a train was coming, really slowly, and it was honking its horn, blowing its whistle, whatever a train has. What's that called? It's not... I don't think you call it honking a horn when you're a freight train conductor, but either way, I'm sure they have a... A whistle! Yes, thank you! Whistle, right. They're blowing the whistle. And, um, the cops were, uh, looking frantically, wondering, uh, should we move? Are we allowed to move? And then their, you know, commanding officer came out waving his hands in front of them, telling them to move. And then they moved. But they weren't allowed to move if a train was coming. So you got to give them credit. They were brave, too, you know. Riot gear doesn't do much against a freight train, you know. Silence breaks, voices are loud, rubber bullets crack, pierce the crowd, heart starts pumping, scared but proud because there's people still sitting in the tear gas cloud, the line advances, they're swinging sticks, you hear the marching boots and the taser clicks, screaming erupts, someone got struck, people calling for a medic, they better hurry up, now the vomit comes like a flood, getting choked by the gas, hands covered in blood, bruised and beaten, limping away, remember it's always been this way, they'll beat you down, show you the guns, they get violent sometimes, and then change comes, you stand firm and organize and then come back to this, too many people for them to Attack, you gotta hold the line Even if your voice shakes, friend of mine Even if your voice shakes Push forward, it's up to you See it through
And it's days like this when something clicks When you're confused, tired, and scared of shit But your body's alive with that heartfelt drive And you engage the problem right before your eyes When you could have ran but you stayed and sat And you were beaten and gassed And you still came back That feeling, the power that you got deep down Rises to the top when you get beat down There's a world to win when your heart is strong And it does a new wrongs to focus on Every day brings a vision to strive for Something to live and die for And when you go back home and you're on your own It's easy to feel like you're all alone But it's through memory and hope that we stay supported Cause we can't quit now We can't afford it, hold the line Even if your voice shakes, friend of mine Even if your voice shakes, push forward It's up to you, see it through like when you're a songwriter, you write a song when you're, maybe you had four cups of coffee that day or something, or, and it's really fast, and then you go to play it like a year later, and you're like, man, I was younger or something, I don't know. This is not one of those songs. Um, I had a funny thought today. I was listening to Chuck Berry. Uh, in my truck on the way here, Chuck Berry, A, not only did he invent rock and roll pretty much, he invented punk rock as well. Um, Chuck Berry's the most punk rock dude. And I was listening to that song, Roll Over Beethoven, and I was thinking to myself, Roll Over Bob Dylan. Because I live in Bob Dylan's shadow, like every other male folk singer. Uh, females live with Ani DeFranco. Um, I mean, that's like literally, you know. I'm in a collective with, with, a, with nine folk singers, and it's like everyone's either compared to Ani DeFranco or Bob Dylan, or maybe if they've heard some more folk music, you get Billy Bragg, which is a long shot, you know. Um, not, not lyrically, but, you know, musically, I'm not Billy Bragg. Um, but it's a note, because you're like, have you never heard another folk singer? Really? It's all good. Like, I don't, I'm not, I don't, like, get hostile with the people, but, it, you know, it gets annoying. Um, because... I, you know, some of us are very different from Bob Dylan um, in, how, in how, we, how our music engages the world and how we see ourselves in the world and what we do with our spare time and stuff like that, you know? And it's all good. I like Bob Dylan, you know? Um, but so the first line takes a little stab at that. And it's not necessarily a stab at the, at the concept, but the idea of, like, sometimes when I listen to Blowing in the Wind, I think it's a super inspirational song, and other times it sounds to me like that John Mayer song, Waiting for the World to Change. And, and that the answer is blowing. But if the answer is blowing, it's because somebody took the answer and was like... And so I want to write songs for those folks, people taking... If you're offended by any of that, come talk to me later. We can work it out. <laughs> I hear the wind blowing, but I don't hear no answer. A lot of folks are looking for the perfect pill to cure the social cancer. Oh, ain't gonna come today. And oh, you gotta take the long way. Cops driving by in the middle of the night, you can hear those sirens screaming. Someone else is going off to jail tonight while the neighborhood's still dreaming. Oh, ain't gonna come today, and oh, gotta take the long way. So many going off to fight that war, so many don't want to go. So many shipped out today, as many ship out tomorrow. Ain't gonna come today, and oh, gotta take the long way. Hear a lot of people shouting out, thinking they found the program, the one that'll finish the job at last, but it's only gonna control them. Oh, ain't gonna come today, and oh, you gotta take the long way. So a lot of friends of mine think that that verse is about only sectarian socialist groups. But it's also about sectarian anarchists and anarchist groups and sectarian liberal lefties and sectarian progressives and dogmatic blah, blah, blahs and blah, blah, blah. You understand. 
The point is, is that folks who generally agree on things should be open-minded about figuring out what to do about them and the solutions. And I was a very dogmatic person for, for many years. And it was very hard to learn the lesson that, that I got to think critically about method and delivery and, and cause and effect and all of that stuff. And um, this song was, was part of that process. And there's a Howard Zinn quote um, that's, that's in this song on the recorded version of it where he says, you know, basically beware of revolutions that happen in weekends because great changes don't usually happen in weekends. Be very skeptical of that. It takes a long time. And that's a hard, that's a hard thing to feel hopeful about, but when you see the process work out, you feel a lot better about it. You might not see the outcomes, but we might see the clues. Cause when you plant a seed, it's gotta grow before it blooms. Oh, ain't gonna come today. And oh, you gotta take the long way. Oh, ain't gonna come today. And oh, you gotta take the long way. Thanks, y'all.